going back to what we were talking about yesterday, that we want to talk, we want to enter a time of identificational repentance and identificational confession to, based on what we heard yesterday. And I would like to say something, I want to emphasize something very specifically. We are not the first people to do to repent we're not the only ones to repent and we and we're not actually the ones who really do it we're not the in this sense in this sense when we're talking about repentance we're talking about dimensions of a stream of repentance as a movement that God wants to release today that we are entering into and everyone in his own specific location his own time and place in his situation and in his church where he's at home his home church is just contributing something to this identificational repentance laying a stone in the structure it's a very important act in this context that every pastor, every um, step that we take in repentance, every stone that we lay, every moment of repentance, every act of confession, we make repentance broader and stronger and deeper. And it becomes more and more visible and more and more perfect and more and more complete in the kingdom of God. And we make our own contributions, but we're not the only ones. Secondly, I want to remind people that what we're talking about when we're talking about repentance and confession, it's not, it's not a case of vicarious repentance, that we're taking the place of somebody else. We, we're not taking the place of the people. We're not... We're not we're, we're not taking the place of people who committed these acts hundreds of years ago. We're not uh, t repenting in their stead. We're repenting for the acts themselves. We confront the sin and the guilt of our fathers. We identify with it. We don't. And what this means as we re we observe we we don't uh, point at we don't point at the people who are guilty we don't accuse them we just identify with their actual guilt and we don't want to judge them or condemn them and we don't sweep it under the rug we want to confess it we confess before the living god and it is important that we mark this distinction because, as we said yesterday, the guilt has consequences. Consequences for the next generations. For Yeah. As we read in uh, Exodus, that God, God uh, punishes the sins of the fathers into the third and fourth generation. Yeah, into the next generations. And the, cons the consequences... The consequences of this sin, of this guilt, can be continued in the next generations if the sin also continues and is not confessed. And this means that the sin, the guilt of the fathers, also brings bad and difficult consequences to the future generations. It has negative effects and consequences. And that's something that affects us today. We have to start there. In our generation, how are we in our generation? We are still suffering. We are still suffering from the consequences of the sins of our fathers today. And we feel it today. And these consequences... These consequences must be ended. We have to stop them. We have to put an end to the sin and uh, confess the guilt and repent. In the sense of, it's the guilt of the individual churches, where the uh, fathers, father generations, have been brought guilt upon themselves, and the churches, churches themselves, have brought down the guilt of the fathers upon their own heads. And we have to, they have, we have to confront their negative consequences in the spiritual realm today. We have to um, bring this to light in our churches and confess. And we bring, um, these consequences include such things as condemnations of other groups, self-condemnation in many areas. Of course, the, the consequence of guilt is, comes, 
Yeah, it also affects the people who were victims, who were uh, affected by the sin. For example, the Anabaptists and in the evangelical churches, we have to deal with our own churches. It gives, it has um, consequences for your own church, for those who uh, brought the guilt upon themselves, and for those who persecuted. And cur- a curse is the opposite of blessing. A blessing is standing before the face of God when God turns his face to us. And curse means God turns his face away from us. It is the loss of blessing. Curse is always a loss of blessing. It's losing treasures. We talked about the treasures of our individual denominations and our traditions, and we lose them. We compromise them through these curses that we bring about through our sin and our lack of confession. And we're going to, that's why we want to confess. We want, we have these representatives of the various churches and movements, and we want them to confess only for their own spiritual fathers and do uh, show repentance. They want to confess they confess before God the sins of their own fathers, but only the sins of their own fathers. They want to take individual responsibility. That God will lay the blood of Jesus, apply the blood of Jesus to this guilt, because in Jesus every curse is destroyed. We can make ourselves free. We can free ourselves from the curse of sin. We can free ourselves from the curse of sin. And we can live in this new freedom. And when we do this through confession and repentance, we can break this line of curse, this continuing stream of curse, and we can change that. We can transform it from a line, from a complete stream of sin and guilt into a stream of blessing and forgiveness. And that is our task here. We don't want to look in anger at the sin but we want to forgive them and we want to cover them with the blood of Jesus that we ask God to cover them with the, these sins with the blood of, that he doesn't so that this guilt does not become a constant source of curse and a constant cor- source of continuing sin but it, that it stops and that we end this line of curse and that we begin instead to release ble- a stream of blessing in, uh, to our time and to our generations. That's our plea. That's our what we do with identificational repentance. It's not aimed just at the past. It's aimed at the future. It's, talking, it's aimed at engendering blessing for the future. We want we don't just we take things out of the past we bring them to light and we ask the Lord please don't let these things continue to cause curses we want to we want to see lines of blessing arise and that's what we want that's what we want with this we want to unleash new blessing we want to put an end to the curse and unleash new lines of blessing in the Lord it's It's about deliverance when we do this, when we pray for deliverance for the church, for the where the church uh, has accrued guilt, and for the others who were afflicted by this guilt, who were victims of this sin, and this release, we we pray that the Holy Spirit comes into these various churches in a new and better way, that doors are opened for the Holy Spirit, that each of these churches can be released, can be delivered. And that every potential within them and the callings that they have, that they can live out their callings truly, that it be guided by the Holy Spirit, that they be together and unify in Christ Jesus. That's the purpose of identificational repentance. Thank you, Helmut. And we've uh, built in a... It's very important that we uh, take time to reflect. Nobody can say it as well as Helmut. What we're talking about here, what is the important part of this? Why why are we uh, taking time to do this? I would like to ask that the Minich Myers uh, prepare to... uh, that they stand at the ready, that we look at this picture, this image on the screen here. We are entering into identificational repentance. It's a matter where we ask the Holy Spirit to lead us, and we've prepared some things, but we 
we don't know how God's going to lead us, so what we prepared, we may not exactly do precisely what we've written. So uh, Philip Owens, uh, come up here on the stage, get ready with music. Music. And, um, okay, Helen Bartsch has also come up here. And Franz Rettmeier. You also need to be uh, ready to uh, join us up here. This image here, this picture, is from a painter in Germany, Sigrid Köder. And we took it as the image for a small booklet that uh, deals with the, its title is The Wounds of History. And it was written by Peter Hawken, Father Peter Hawken. You can find it on the table over here on the side. And it's free of charge. You can get it as a gift, really. And we want, for me, the important thing about the prayer is this image. To the, the, the cross stands in blood. That's what's in this image, the cross drenched in blood. That's what we want to remember what happened at Golgotha. God tears down the walls between us and we bring our sin when we bring our sins to the cross that's that's what happens and we see forgiveness and healing and that's where we're going to start I would like to begin with something that uh, entered into my heart that really uh, hit me when I was studying this matter and I want to begin with the Bible verse where it's talking about binding and loosening Binding and loosening has been used in churches in church history for the church. Uh, the church is, uh, has been used uh, by the church to exercise power and by the church to justify its actions. And in this Bible passage, we have two Bible passages that are often invoked one for the uh, church itself and one for the Catholic Church for the for the Pope often and I would like to take the Bible Bible passage from that's used by the papal office it's Matthew 16 18 you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the powers of the underworld will not overcome it and I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven and what you on bind on earth will be bound on heaven and what you loosen on earth will be unleashed on earth or unleashed in heaven this Bible passage has led to a claim of primacy in the Catholic Church for the Bishop of Rome specifically. But at the beginning, it was just, it was the Bishopric of Rome was simply the first among uh, many. The first was uh, primus inter pares in Latin, uh, which basically means it's part of a bind of, bond of love between all bishops, but was not preeminent. I remind you of the uh, passage in the Bible, uh, John 21, do you love me more than these others? And if that's the case, then feed my sheep. At the beginning, there was a primacy of uh, belief and a primacy of conversion. And we look at the uh, Bible passage in Luke 23, where uh, Jesus says, I have prayed for you that your faith does not vanish, that your faith does not go out, and when you have converted, when you have returned and strengthened your brothers. This means Peter was always supposed to be reminded that he uh, had betrayed Jesus but and that he needs to return and strengthen his brothers after he has been strengthened by Jesus. So at the beginning, Peter was... He is... Yeah, in the church art history, Peter is often depicted with the, the rooster as a reminder that he had betrayed Jesus. But only later is he depicted with the keys to the kingdom of heaven. So from the beginning, there was always the danger that the Roman church would, would use these that these would use these Bible passages to exercise its own power and to impose uniformity with its views on all the other churches. 
This binding, which means to uh, ban others and to excommunicate them, and led, it, it uh, took them beyond the scope of their legitimate power and their legitimate authority. And through the centuries, this passage in the Bible was misused by lead church leaders and popes, especially. Uh, Pope Gregory VII, that was in the 11th century, used this spiritual principle and abused it as a, took this biblical principle and abused it as a political weapon. And the high point was the time of the Great Schism the division within the Roman Catholic Church that lasted 40 years. It was in the uh, late 14th, early 15th centuries. So there were three popes at one time. And yeah, three popes at the same time, and each one had his supporters. And each one of them had excommunicated the others and banned them from the church. And I don't know if you... You need to really understand what that means. Imagine what it means. You can imagine that it went through families, it went through uh, church, uh, holy orders, through churches, that Europe was really torn apart. And what it means when we think about... When we talk about uh, identificational repentance for the sins of the past, and what kind, we need to think about what kinds of curses that, that inflicted upon us and what we're carrying, still carrying today. And it, it really ruined the reputation. It really ruined the reputation of the papacy itself and it split Europe into warring camps. And afterward, and almost at the same time, it already had started, since the 11th century it had really started, the, the, the papacy was transformed into an isolated and untouchable position, something that couldn't be assailed legitimately by anyone. Until finally, the uh, Pope was regarded as the chief leader of the entire church and all churches as the highest teacher, the uppermost director, the uppermost leader, the uppermost judge. And in our preparation, we also need to mention something about the Catholic Church. We thought, we've heard so much today already on this day. It's and maybe, maybe God will send us something, send us something through the Holy Spirit to um, process all this, that we can uh, deal with all the information. It can seem like too much. When we think about what happened back then, and we are now going to see a scene, a, a theatrical scene. We have a, invited a pope, to Wittenberg, and a king, and a little child, and they are going to uh, show you here on the stage what the popes did in the time between from the 12th to the 14th centuries, what they said about themselves. It was mainly Innocence the Third, Peter the Ninth, and Boniface the Eighth. And we also will hear how the uh, Anabaptists responded. So we asked the uh, Pope, the King, and the child to come up on stage. I have been given all power on earth. I am the father of the princes and kings, the Lord of the world and the earthly representative of Jesus Christ. All of England belongs to me as my fiefdom, and I am prepared to defend the church state with, violent, with the force of web arms, and I am rigorous in my persecution of those who challenge my authority. Okay, that's kind uh, the child says something that uh, puts calls us all into question, but 
uh, acoustically, it's not really, I can't really hear it. You, you are in error, says the king. The, Jesus transferred his own holiness to the Pope. And we work together closely in order to bring about the salvation of our subjects. I am the Lord le, ruler anointed by God, and I make sure that laws and orders are obeyed. And if the orders and directives are not obeyed, then we will excommunicate and ban people. And we will. Jesus gave us the authority to do this. For there is no salvation outside the church. But now there are simple people who want to uh, deny our rights to do this. They they claim that they are they claim that they are followers of Jesus Christ, and they want to disrupt our society, and they don't want to pay taxes to support wars, and they don't want to perform, and uh, they don't want to serve in the army. And since our and they don't take oaths either, and since our entire society is built on mutual obligations that are secured by oaths, this, which gives us real security. So they are these. They are our enemies in faith. Luther, Zwingli, Teubert. They even share our opinion of the organization of the state, though. They think that this is the correct social order. They just want to determine who has the say. We are the ones to whom everyone should obey. But Luther and his friends say that people should obey God more than people. Where do we get... They call... They call us the sons of Pilate and the descendants of Caiaphas. Luther condemned these. Condemned these. Uh, Luther condemned all these Baptists and these other people too because he claimed they were taking the authority of the Word of God for themselves, and were using it to tear down social order without being ordained. And they do the same with. Communion and baptism, and they say that human people have been held prisoner for a thousand years, and that the interpretation of the Bible is limited to those who speak Latin and to those who have been approved by the church. And where will we end up if everybody can read the Bible in their own language and feels empowered to interpret themselves? And when we don't baptize babies and small children, where do we end up then? They think that they're better than us. We are the true church of Christ, even though that they complain that they are. The Luther also condemned the Anabaptists and said that the word of God, who take the word of God into the own hand and preach without being ordained. And they do the same thing with baptism and with uh, communion. They claim that we have helped people captive for a thousand years because the word of God is only transmitted to people who speak Latin and who are called to serve in the church. Where will we wind up if everybody can take the word of God into their own hands, can read it in their own language? They murder the soul of the young children because they don't allow them to be baptized. And additionally, they think there's something better. But we are the true church of Christ. And that Swiss reformer, Zwingli, he thinks that the battles with the ancient church are a com child child's play compared to the battle against the baptist Baptists, the Anabaptists, and he claims that they are children of the devil who bring everything into disorder and disarray. They are heretics, and they will be condemned under our laws. They will be sentenced to death. Calvin, Luther, and Zwingli are of the same opinion. Chain them, throw them in the tower. We will dispose of them. We will torture them. 
and maybe they will uh, return to the bosom of the Holy Mother Church, but if they don't, we, we will burn them and we will drown them because beheading them is too easy for them. We've repeatedly heard that the Anabaptists had this amazing missional sense that they wanted to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everyone, everyone, man or woman, had this sense of mission in the Anabaptist movement. And regardless of what they... And they were also ready to suffer for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the reports already speak for themselves, what we've heard about it. They are, were ready to suffer and die to go with Jesus in his suffering. As Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, expressed it, we have, we have some brief, uh, we've listed just some brief uh, repeats from, repeats from the, uh, about the uh, Anabaptists, Peter of Edemann, 1540 was captured and he wrote communion with Christ Jesus in his suffering makes even the darkest dungeon into daylight because the doors of heaven themselves open up and we enjoy eternal fellowship with Jesus Christ in our suffering. Wolfgang Brandmüller, who was executed in Rotenburg in uh, 1529, wrote from prison the following, all of our internal and external lives are, should be formed according to Jesus' will. He died with 70 other Anabaptists. Shortly after, he wrote this letter and sent it to uh, the co church community in Rotenburg. Hans Hafner, a member in a community in Meeren, wrote from the uh, Tower of the Bishop in Passau, the entire world wants Jesus, but they walk right past him. They only, they only want to receive him as the giver of gifts. They don't want to know him they don't want to share his path of suffering. We must be prepared, man, woman, child, we must be prepared to leave our parents, our country, our possessions. We must be willing to, to give it all up for Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ. We confess before you that we have sinned. And we have obscured your face in that we have persecuted our own brothers and sisters. We have executed them as heretics, though they were following you. Forgive us our pride and our arrogance our hatred for those who did not accept our order because they wanted to live out your Beatitudes. We have entered into false agreements with the rulers of this world and we did not seek our security and our peace in you but in, but in mutually binding oaths and bonds of loyalty that were entirely worldly. There is a mark of Cain on our foreheads, Lord. Their innocent blood that cries out against us because 
Remember the poor and their cries of desperation you never forget. This guilt, O oh Lord, we bring this guilt before you to you on the cross and we thank you that you died for us and that you took this guilt upon yourself you bore our guilt we come before you with hearts full of contrition and we ask you O father in heaven for forgiveness what we for what we have done to you break the curse that we have brought upon ourselves and cover up cover up this guilt wash away this guilt with your precious blood Lord Jesus amen and now we ask that all those from their spiritual perspective are who um, consider themselves to be spiritual descendants of the Anabaptist movement and in their church background that they would come up onto the stage second request that those who want to who want to uh, pray for our brothers and sisters, would you come up to the stage as well? So on the stage are uh, Anna, spirit, spiritual descendants of the Anabaptists and those who wish to pray for them and pray with them. We, as the body of Christ, have lost many of the values that we were especially important to the Anabaptists. And this one is special value is the refraining from violence. They, they really followed the Beatitude, blessed are the meek. In German it's translated as blessed are those who do not use force. And they say that force, use of violence does not produce not solve problems, but produces more and more of them. And the legacy of the Reformation and the persecution of the Anabaptists speaks for itself what the consequences were with the Thirty Years' War and the First World War and the Second World War and the uh, legacy of which we are still living with today. Pope John Paul II, who's said, said this way, violence is a lie because it violates the truth of our faith. It is an offense against the truth of our humanity. The teaching, the teaching of peace and nonviolence is in the center of the person of Jesus Christ and his, the Lamb of God and his death on the cross uh, as understood. Yeah, what I recognize, that second part was not from John Paul II, it was from me, that uh, we see this best in the Anabaptists, that through violence that all of us and who persecuted them at that time became, yeah, incurred guilt upon ourselves and bear this still and today. In identification with my Lutheran church, and my uh, and the pastorate of the Lutheran Church, I confess and I name as sin the sin of pride and arrogance, which led to rejection and defamation and uh, devaluing brothers and sisters in Christ from other churches, especially you and the uh, Anabaptist movements. And I confess the sin of uh, the sin of the sin of forbidding you to preach because we joined in uh, the sin of the worldly powers of the political powers and forbidding you to uh, uh, preach the word of God in public and we trusted in the power of law uh, instead of the gospel we violated the fifth commandment because we 
because we took the lives, the property, and even the families of our fellow Christians unlawfully, unjustly. We, we destroyed spiritual and physical life in order to preserve our own power. We violated the seventh commandment. We sinned against it. And we have the blood of we have the blood of the uh, we have the blood of the Anabaptists who we executed and drove out on our own hands. And we violated also the eighth commandment. Then because we spoke evil of you, we spoke unjustly, we spoke evil and we defamed you. And because of your uh, differences in theology, we lied about you. And we ask the triune God for forgiveness, that we too proud, we were too proud, and that we wouldn't let our own relationship with God be questioned by the Anabaptists, and we wouldn't reflect on our own conscience. And today, even today in our pastorate, in our church, this attitude remains. We confess to our Catholic and our Anabaptists and to the entire communion of saints. We confess this guilt and its consequences, and we want to end it. And we rely here, we place ourselves in God's hands and rely on His mercy. And founded on the cross of Jesus Christ, and we confess we have sinned. And we ask God to forgive us out of His great mercy. And we ask you for our own forgiveness. We ask the triune God and our brothers and sisters in the free churches, the Catholic Church, and in the Messianic Jewish we ask uh, for forgiveness. As a priest and bishop of the Diocese of Mainz, I gladly, gladly join with uh, the Bishop of Vienna, Christoph Schoenborn, and join in agreement with what he said uh, through his message. And I want to say, I identify, I identify with the priests and bishops through the centuries and ask the Lord that he allow that I, in their names, confess before you and before God our guilt. I confess before God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of the Jews, and before you all, my brothers and sisters in Christ, that we wanted more we wanted we wanted more we were more concerned with our own power we wanted uh, money and power and political influence which we would gain through war and through political alliances this was more important to us than the gospel what was actually our yeah, it's what the Lord actually entrusted to us, what the Lord actually charged us to do. I confess you and before the Lord that we very often didn't have either, didn't want to listen and we didn't have a heart for the uh, following Christ Jesus with you. But you heard him and you followed him and we persecuted you for it. And that we very often, we very often did, did not teach the people entrusted to us correctly that following Jesus is actually the goal of human life. It's the goal. It's actually our duty here on earth as Christians. And I confess that we did not believe often enough. We didn't believe that the Holy Spirit could speak to us through you. We weren't we did not trust God too often. That he wanted to give us a message through you. We far too often rejected prophetic messages and showed contempt for them. And I confess that we were gravely mistaken about you when you asked for the baptism of faith and that you were willing to pay the 
You were willing to pay the consequences for this uh, conviction, even to martyrdom, even to death. I confess, because of our own indecision and incapability, that we continued not to understand you and not to want to understand you. And I confess that today we have hardly even noticed that you are there. And we have hardly even uh, acknowledged your existence, even today. I personally have to confess for my own part that I... I hardly ever talk with my own Baptist friends about the reasons they believe what they believe, about how God had spoken to them what the basis of their own confession is. Although we were friends and got along together, I showed very little interest in what they believed and what the motivations for their movement were and are. And I thank you. I thank you, Lord, for this day and for your forgiveness. And I ask you and God, our Lord, Jesus Christ, for forgiveness that we have that we have wounded you that we have incurred guilt that we have we persecuted you we tortured you we drove you into exile and that today we have hardly even acknowledged our guilt and hardly even acknowledged your presence and your uh, your identity as our brothers and sisters in Christ. And I ask the Lord for forgiveness. I ask the Lord that he I confess also that we have often only looked with great suspicion upon your spiritual descendants. Even in the charismatic renewal within our own church, we have been reserved and we have been unwilling to change. Or, and we have in some cases completely rejected it and we haven't listened to what the Holy Spirit wants to say to us through you and through your spiritual descendants and I personally pray before God and before you and I ask for forgiveness for every every contemptuous every condescending every uh, every condemning thought and word that I've spoken with respect to your theology and your teaching and your way of life. And so I ask you, Lord Jesus Christ, break this bond, uh, break this chain of curses from that, that has stretched from that time to now and that it has uh, distorted our view for the our vision for the for the uh, beautiful gifts that you have given your body through the Anabaptists and through their spiritual descendants who have come out of this source that you wanted to I split it with this I break this curse with the sword of the Spirit the sword of the Holy Spirit and I ask in your grace and your uh, mercy that you Take all of that from us and take it away, the consequences of the sins of our fathers of the faith, which have uh, afflicted our church to this very day, and that you restore the gifts and restore the blessings that you want to give. I ask you, Lord Jesus Christ, that you take the, since you have this crap force and the power, that you can wash away this guilt with your precious blood, and then your wounds, you can bring forth healing and so and the power of healing for us all and let this let the horrible wounds that we have inflicted on each other and for which we ourselves bear the guilt be healed by your blood heal the our brothers and sisters that your wounds lord in your stripes we be healed our brothers and sisters for this church and for our entire world lord and i ask you this amen I'm standing here uh, as the head deacon of our diocese in Vienna and a representative of my bishop, 
Cardinal Schönborn, who has sent you this written text, but here I want to explain it in more detailed words. Brothers and sisters, we have forgotten that you even existed. Not much is found in the school books of Catholic countries. Little is said, definitely not fair is said and mentioned in church history literature. We scratched you from our memory. Please forgive. When we have spoken about you, we painted a wrong picture. You were only mentioned as sectarians, dangerous people, simplistic fundamentalists, bringing stress, fear, and wrong priorities into our people's life. Please forgive. I ask forgiveness for the bloody wars we waged against you, for destroying the dignity of Anabaptist men, women, and children, for our institutional persecution and false accusation in combination with the state, for putting you into prison and sending your men to the galley ships, for torture, terrible and obscene harassment against body, health, and life, for taking away the children from the breasts of their mothers, for burning your leaders at stake. I know that's all too much even to put this in the words, please forgive. But this is all what I can do at this moment. I ask forgiveness for not listening to you, to the voice of the Holy Spirit represented by you and speaking through you. You have challenged our understanding of what is a Christian, what means baptism, discipleship, martyrdom, and we did not want to hear. Please forgive. This has been the past, but it's not undone in the presence. At least we had continued to sin in the last three, five decades. And my Pentecostal brothers in our country can tell stories about this, sad stories. We followed the sins of our Catholic fathers. Even when we stopped killing you physically, we still denied your existence, importance, and dignity. We have excluded you from our society, from our villages, and when you wanted to build a church building, we had our ways to hinder that. Please forgive. 
And here is a declaration. As we have become a terrible curse for you over all these five centuries, here we declare we want to become a blessing to you with the help of God. Please receive this word as a commitment. Amen. We stand here as members of our various families and our ancestors with whom we identify, whose names we bear, who were who had rulership over land in Europe for centuries. And I think about all of my ancestors. I remember all my maternal and paternal ancestors who were ruled over principalities. I remember the so-called Winter King, Frederick of Faults, my grandfather 10 generations back of whom I was very proud and with whom I now identify in pride. And I think I remember the defender of Vienna and in pride, the, the pride of my family had in mili rulership, uh, regency and military power over simple people and over over their church itself, actually. And for this reason, I ask for forgiveness for all what was done in the name of my family, everything that happened through the centuries, for the persecution of those, for being driven into exile from our lands, forced conversions, all that we forced you to uh, into exile and to drive you from our land. And I ask the Lord for forgiveness. I ask Jesus Christ for forgiveness. Our common Lord, the sole King, the honor to Him alone. I lay down all false pride, all false honor, and I call out the, and I declare the kingship of Jesus Christ, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, in his name. I identify with worldly powers with the family of my mother, the family Waldeck. The Waldecks were responsible for, for, hanging the, for hanging the Anabaptists in cages in front of the church in Münster. I ask Jesus that he forgive this sin, this evil act with his blood that today and thereafter that he makes in our families that he makes our hearts wide in our family for you he creates space in our hearts for you and our family this is the moment where we would like to embrace you, if you and now they're going to hug on stage they're going to embrace each other
There's several minutes of silence here and applause. And now, tears of joy have been flowing here. I, at least, have been crying, weeping for joy, and I think Jesus weeps tears of joy with us, which also yeah, it's almost difficult for me to say something uh, in this expression of forgiveness Identification is its own thing, but we, we accept the forgiveness that comes from Jesus, and as Christians, all of us, when we pray the Our Father, we ask for forgiveness. We ask, forgive us our sins, which while we forgive those who have sinned against us, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We ask for forgiveness for our guilt. And I've been asked by the brothers and sisters here to say something. I hope it's in the sense that they meant. I can, yeah, others can say something if they uh, want to say something different. I want to thank Thank you all for all your words and for this event that you put on together. For what has happened here today, I thank you. And I suggest that we we thank our, the Lord together, our Father, that we uh, speak together, the, that we pray the um, Father, the, uh, our Father together. Uh, I took something out of my uh, my. Uh, speech here, uh, something I want to uh, also include something, uh, react to something Hans Peter said. Uh, when I was preparing and reading about the history of the uh, Anabaptists in Austria and Moravia as a member of a non-denominational evangelical church, I identified with what these, our ancestors in the faith, um, did wrong through the centuries. And I, and I want to confess that today here too. I confess that, that it was only occasionally possible for them to really reach a an even keel between uh, the word and the spirit to create to reach a balance of word and spirit in the way they live their Christian lives, or at least to strive toward that as a goal. But instead, they went to one extreme or the other, either Bible based, but and against the Holy Spirit anti-charismatic, so to speak. Or, on the other side, they went very spiritual, charismatic, but uh, going beyond the actual written word of God. And I confess that my ancestors and the Spirit began to regard their own tradition as sacrosanct and untouchably holy, but even though it was more cultural than biblical. And I want to say before God that even there were terrible excesses and errors even among the Anabaptists and the Baptists. Münster has been mentioned here, and that drew... Um, that dragged the name of Jesus into the mud for centuries, 
For centuries, it cast the Anabaptist movement in a very bad light. And I confess, for many Anabaptists, became very narrow in their hearts and their capacity for love, and that they they often they often would exclude and condemn even their fellow Baptists and fellow Anabaptists for even the slightest differences in doctrine or in practice, that they condemned them, they damned them, and they even said that they were unchristian and that they broke fellowship with them. And I confess that I not only recognize these tendencies in my own heart, these same tendencies, but also I see it in uh, non-denominational evangelical churches in the 21st century. And for this reason, I ask, Lord, please free us from this, free me from this, from this evil. Free us from this evil, in Jesus' name, amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.